Welcome everybody to the SciLife Lab AI seminar series. My name is Ola Spjut. I'm the AI coordinator at SciLife Lab Data Center. And in this seminar series, we have topics of applied AI in life science research. And it's a bit of a mix of scientific highlights from SciLife Lab affiliated researchers and invited experts. The meeting is recorded and the, the they are always published online on Scilab Lab uh, homepage. So today, I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Arne Elofsson from Stockholm University and Science for Life Laboratory. And uh, Professor Elofsson's main research interest is to understand the most fundamental questions about proteins, their function and evolution. For example, how is a pro novel protein created? What's the main function of alternative splicing? How can we predict the structure of large molecular machines and the folding of transmembrane proteins? And uh, Arne will today give us a presentation with the title. Uh, uh, let's see if I can shift this. Uh, using deep learning uh, and co-evolution to predict protein-protein interactions. And uh, we will do this uh, the normal way that we always do it. We will. Um, take questions after the presentation. Uh, Arne says that he will talk for about approximately 40 minutes uh, and you will write questions in the chat and I will read them up to Arne after. And then we will finish at 3 p.m. Uh, latest. So with this, I will give the word to you Arne. And okay. thank you for thank presenting. Thank you for the introduction. Now I need to share my screen. Uh, well, I don't... Now I think you see it all. Yes, this is good. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I will talk, man, one of the long standing problems in life science has been to understand how proteins fold, because as you all know, proteins make most of the molecular functions in a cell or in life in general. And you might have heard that. Uh, approximately six months ago, uh, DeepMind from uh, Alphabet or Google presented their results in the CASP conference, which sort of revolutionized the accuracy that people can predict protein structures from uh, scratch. That means not using, at least not directly using the information from a homologous template. And you can just uh, see some of the results here down to the left. So these are two proteins. I think the green is the native structure and the blue is predictions. And you can see they are basically spot on. And to the right here, you can see what they did was like, uh, this is a quality measure, the DTT, so it's basically zero to 100, 100 is perfect, zero is completely wrong. And this is the performance from CASP 7, which was in 2006, and the CASP 14, which was last year. And you see, it was basically no major improvement. And then Alpha Fold 1 was introduced in 2018. And uh, it clearly improved performance from like 40% to 60%. And now it jumped up to almost close to 90%. So I will talk about more of the problem of uh, uh, actually what we can do next. What can we do in this new situation? And some indications of what, what we have done and what we have done later. But I will start with a bit of a background and introduction, what is really happening here. So, so, so the idea basis for this is that we always start with some sort of multiple sequence alignment. So this is something that people have done in bioinformatics for the last 40 years. It's a basic fundamental thing. And of course, it contains a lot of information. It contains a lot of do you know what I mean? Essence are there. It contains the evolution information to see what when has uh, the between searches, what I mean, as has mutated and so on. At the same time, we know it's quite hard to get these alignments accurate because they have, uh, uh, particularly nowadays, when they often are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of sequences long. But until maybe 10 years ago, people mainly used to look at them like an average of a representation of families. You looked at you could see that you have a position here that was like a lot of uh, three onines. And then, okay, you say, okay, it's something that was a three onine there. You can see that some amino mean, acids, some positions are more conserved than others, and so on. And you can use this to extract information. But 
the idea of what people start using then is to use, look at two columns at a time. So you look at this column and this column. And then you examine, <coughs> do you have any cool evolution or correlation between this column, column of those here? So you can think about that you can have small amino acids and big amino acids or positive charge and negative charge. So like, uh, if you assume the two residues are in contact, you have one big residue and a small residue, and then the big one mutates to small, and the small one can mutate to become a big one, and just to make out the empty space. And so that would ind indicate that there are correlations. This, is, this type of correlations, mutual information, has been used to infer that two residues are in contact close to each other. That was already done in the 90s, but it didn't really work. And one reason it doesn't work is actually can be illustrated here. And this is actually from a paper from 99 that nobody really cared about. But you assume that you have a well-packed protein. So this is like a part of a protein that is well-packed and it's nicely, see there's no space between them. The amino acids fit nicely each other and so on. But then for some reason, there is a mutation. So this pentamer is replaced by an arrow and that makes this packing less favorable. So to compensate for that, it's more likely or for a, a, that a compensating mutation occurs or not that it occurs, but it gets accepted. So you can uh, mutate this uh, uh, qu quadratic to a pentamere and you have a nice packing again. How, so now you look at something that is, looks quite nice. It has the first this last part of the same, but you see it, it, there are small differences here like this points of this arrow was flat here. So that means that you actually have indirect mutations also. So you need to have to take into account so you have some indirect couplings because of course all amino acids interact not to run, but in several so you have a big network of amino acids interact. So you need to sort of take that into account also when you do this. And yeah, this was done and this was methods called DCA that people mainly use nowadays. There was, I mean, this fundamental was introduced in 99, 2000, but then it was sort of reinvented in 2008, 2009, and it really changed the accuracy of this field. And then after that, the AI come here. So basically you can do the same thing using AI. So this is a me method by David Baker called TRSEPTA, that you take this multiple sequence alignment, you calculate all these properties and all these coevolution features, and then you have a deep network, Kind of standard image network here, but uh, and you predict in this case not only distances, but you also predict the, the angles between every pair of residues, etc. And not only contact, you also predict distances. So you predict the probability of two residues to be eight angstrom or ten angstrom or twelve angstrom away from each other. So this is what we have used in this study here, and then you put this into some kind of uh, your, your smoothest functions, this is predicted into something. You use a very simple minimization of energies and you generate models and you have the final model. So we have just, so basically this is just one example how well this works. So this is a protein that seems to work nicely folded and so on actually this is, and this is, you can do use different alignments and you get like 78% accuracy. It's not as good as alpha fold, but it's quite close to it. Like it's not, uh, well, it's not the details are not as well packed as an alpha fold too, but we are, in most cases, we have the correct fold or protein. So, one thing we did here, so one problem we had with this in the beginning was, for instance, one class of proteins is very common in human protein, you know, which is repeats. So proteins that have the same or very similar unit repeated many times. So as you can see, you can think about it. If you have this, this, these units are similar, so you could imagine you get artificial uh, indirect coupling because you have symmetries here. So if you run this DCA methods here, like you can see up in the left corner, you see that we have contact predicted like at, at several separations. That means that they are sort of artificial contact predicted in these cases. But these methods, here we have our own contact prediction method, deep learning method, and some other deep learning methods are much better filtering away than these contacts. So in this case, the green dots are the correct predictions and the red are the wrong ones and the black ones are also the ones that predict correctly. And you can see that 
this TRS alpha is very similar to what we do, but slightly better. And then you can see that we actually can model most of these proteins very accurately, not only one unit, but several units. We have this, you can, this uh, lives in rich repeat phase, we can model even the bent of it quite nicely accurately. There are a few still that we can't model, like we're not sure about this one, for instance. We have an abelene and a few more where we don't, we are at least not certain the models are correct. And that might be because they actually are quite flexible in nature. So this, this basically shows that basically for all well-folded single domain proteins, with multi-domain proteins, we can make nice accurate models directly from the sequence. So what to do next? Well, the idea is, as you know, most proteins do not act by themselves. They act by interacting with other proteins, with other molecules. So, of course, in principle, you could, if the two proteins are uh, interacting and they do so in an evolutionary concerned way, you should have these co-evolutionary signals also in the interaction um, interface, at least if it's directed in the same way and it's conserved. So basically, if you have a mutation from a positive charge in one of the proteins, that should be compensated to a, by a negative charge in another one and so on. However, there is one big problem here, and that's we need to combine two multiple sequence alignments. So we need to take this alignment and this alignment here and find exactly which two proteins interact. If you take a protein that exists, or two proteins that exist, only in a single copy in every genome, or at least every bacterial genome or something like that, and they all interact in the same way. This is trivial because they can, um, I mean, you know which proteins are there. But of course, we know also that most proteins, particularly in eukaryotes, have a lot of paralogs that have been duplicated, so they exist in many cases. And we don't, then we don't know so if you have five homologs, five parallels of one protein, and five parallels of another one, we don't know which ones interact. If they all interact together, if there are specific pairs, or if they are one that interact with all the others, or if they interact with something else, the evolution has changed them. So we need to solve this problem. And the easiest way to do that is just to take well, the ones that are most similar to the protein you start from and assume that they interact. But that's certainly not always correct. But uh, we have, yeah, so that's a challenge, and of course, also it reduces the number of sequences we have in the alignment a lot because we can only take the pairs that match. So if we, we can't use all the parallels, we only use one part closer in each genome. But at least we can do that, and we can then basically run exactly the same alignment uh, prediction map here, and then we can make this prediction contact maps down here. So I will just go through this for a second. So you don't lose me. And the first part you see here is that I, in all these plots I have, when the structure is known, the top right part, so that part up here, is the predictions, is the distances from the real structure to the native structure. That means that these are distances, it means that these two residues here, between 50 and 80, are very close. They are 86 or so away from each other. And the ones that are between 50 and 260 are maybe 16 angstrom away from each other. And then I put in these two lines, blue lines in the middle, so that is for separating the two chains, because I put in some artificial glyphs there that I don't use later, but they have to separate them. And then so the ones in the upper right triangle is a native interface contact. So you see here, in this case, you have a number of contacts that exist in the interface. And you could you should compare them to the ones in the bottom left where you have predicted the interface contacts. So you see in this case, actually, there are a few contacts predicted in the interface, but because the PVV is zero, they're all wrong. And you can see then we have the models we make, we actually get it in the more or less right position, but it's completely wrong orientation of the native, of the, of the small molecule dots in big molecule. But yeah, so then we basically use very similar algorithms as TRS as before, we use matrix contact maps. We can use a couple of different algorithms for folding it. We can use Prosepta, we can use CNS, which is PyControl. So they are quite st standard ways and they take 
a couple of hours around, they felt thing to do. And while well, the pyro set is slightly better, but it's slightly slower also, so it's a balance. We can also of course use traditional docking methods, which is like you try to take the fixed shape of the structures and put them together and see and use this, uh, this predicted content as constraints. So that, that can be done also, but it doesn't provide in our case, in our test, it doesn't provide a significant improvement, but we'll come back to it in a while. So we do this, and at least you can see some proteins that exist that work well. So this is just one human protein between NOT1 and CAF1. And you can see that these predictions here are quite accurate. So we have almost 300 contact predictions. So these half are correct, so half is wrong. See, we predict too many contacts here. But you can really see the pattern here that this, uh, whatever it is, 50 contacts out here are pretty something similar. And you can see that the resulting models are quite good. I mean, they are both, both in the chains looks more or less the same. I don't remember which one. I think the dark ones are the native structure and the light ones are the, are, are the models. But you see, they are quite similar. Certainly, there are detailed differences. You have some loops that are perfect and interfaces are maybe perfect. But um, at least it's the right place. And our mesh of evaluation is like, is, has a doc Q score, which is like also a score between 0 and 1, and it's 0.42, which is quite good in this case. It's one of the better cases there. And this is another example. You can see that it has a different shape. And you can see that maybe you don't get the loops here perfect, but it's, it's completely different type of interactions. And we can predict it quite well. And you see that this contact map is actually 80% accurate. So basically, you can really see the patterns. We don't have uh, all this middle group here of contacts not predicted, but the rest are pretty nicely. And you can really see that you can't hardly separate for individual proteins. The contact maps or the distance maps looks almost identical. Right? It's hard to see. There are few, few differences here and there, but they're almost perfect. Unfortunately, then, if you do this on a large scale, it doesn't always work. So this is just a way of showing that early on, it was, it's a big parameter. If you need to do exactly, you need a lot of sequences in multi sequence alignment. So if you look at the quality of the individual proteins, that is clearly correlated with the size so of the multi sequence alignment, which is the number of sequences in the alignment or number of effective sequences. We take away the ones that are too similar. So you see, you need like hundred at least to do good models. Team scores is always between zero and one. So if you have only like 10, you rarely ever get a model. And there are a few that are good if you have only one, but basically you need a hundred sequences. And that's of course for most families like that is a problem because we have a lot of sequence data. But if you look at the quality of this docking, it does not at all correlate with size of the alignment. There are a few cases here and there, that all since I have about uh, actually about 100 sequences, this is wrong, I think, in this case, uh, that, that are pretty good, but the rest are not. I mean, there's no strong correlation. So, one thing you can try is supposed to do make the alignments different, you use different types of alignments. You can basically vary about uh, the different number of iterations in the alignments, you can use different coverage, you can include different probabilities of the predictions and so on. And, you, and we tried many different things. And in short, nothing makes a huge difference. This is like just six of these methods we tried. And you see the average score is like from 0.2 to 0.4. And the number of good models we find are something between five and 10. So that's, it's, not, uh, but it's not a huge difference. In good models is just score over a certain cutoff here, which is defined to be an acceptable model. And if you look at the proteins that happens to be good, so this is the models that is good, at least in one model, one of these six methods, you can see that for most of them, actually there's only a few models, few methods to make a good model. So you several make a good, bad one, but several makes a good one. At least one GPW is something that seems to work in every case, and also this for GMG, so there are a few. And a few that only is only one that makes a good one, but a few that is a, a small subset of them. And it's not systematic, like fewer iterations, more iterations works better. So if you look at the individual cases, you can see things like this. So for this protein, one a, a, a y 7 if you have three iterations, you make a nice prediction. You have 60 contacts within 
accuracy of 89 percent at the view of one iteration you have basically no long contacts these are so this is just noise and of course stuff is correct but for another protein it's the other way around so here with one iteration you have a nice prediction with like six contacts with 80 percent accuracy but if you do three iterations you lose it all but you can also see that in both these cases the individual proteins contact maps distance maps are accurately predicted so uh, we started then uh, looking into what are the features that separates the good and the bad models so the good and what, what, like correct or incorrect models so one thing you can see is that as we saw before that you need to have about 100 sequences in the uh, in the alignment to have a correct model. But you, are, you can see also that there are a lot of more bad incorrect models also have equal amount of sequences. And of course, this, the, the, the volume of the incorrect model is much bigger than the model of the correct models. So there are many more of these examples here. But it's also subsets, maybe one third of all the models that have basically one sequence or zero sequences in the, uh, in the alignment. Uh, you can also see that you have uh, uh, the model, the individual proteins, so the TM score of the individual two chains has to be correct. Basically, you have a TM score of like 0.8 or something like that to make good models docking. It makes sense. It also makes sense that if you have many sequences, you get good models. But you also see here there are many individual proteins that are nicely folded, both proteins, but they are docked in the wrong way. Uh, and if you can look at how many contacts, how many interchain contacts you predict, and you see that you have this seems to be sort of a magical number, which is about 100, which is sort of the same number of contacts you have in the native structures. So that sort of makes sense. Right? You, cannot, you cannot have zero. You can also see that it's a subset here, we predict way, way too many more contacts, and these are not good either. And then there are a few where you manage to get a good model by only predicting one or two contexts, but that's maybe just pure luck that this happens to become look nicely. And of course, also this context that you predict needs to be correct. You see that they have like an MCC value of 0.8, but for the for the ones where you fail, you basically predict no contacts or wrong contacts. In some cases, have very low values. It may be one or two exceptions here. So this means basically if you have, so this is, yeah, yes, this is how it looks like when you have a good model, you have the contrast pretty correctly and you have a nice model that you end up with. But if you have basically a few contrast predicted and they are, even if they are correct, you might get sort of the right interface areas, but you don't get it docked correctly. So this is certainly, See, you have sort of, you put in the right area of the protein, but it's not docked in the right way. So it's the structure is, is wrong, so it's incorrect. You can also say, you know, you, one other type of thing to notice is one that you have back here. You see that in some cases, we have very many contacts predicted, and we trace that down to cases where you have a high similarity between the two chains. So there are two chains that are not identical, but they can still be similar enough. They have, can be homologous. And if you have that, you end up sometimes with type of artifacts. Basically, you see here that the contact maps to the individual chains look basically the same. And then you just have a copy of that in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the interchain area, which is, so far, doesn't contain any information about in the native contact here. And then you end up in models. I mean, you have also more complex things that you actually have partial in homology. It's not the whole protein, it's just one part of it. Actually, this is probably three domains that are very similar. And uh, you have then, uh, uh, yeah, so then you also end up with models that look quite bad. And there are, but they're all, you can try to filter this away so you can make another alignment to do that. And you can get rid of some of it, but unfortunately you lose all the signals also, so you never have any good success. So we haven't really, we got rid of most of the contacts, but it's still the ones that remain are not correct. 
Okay. Uh, well, the, the only good thing about this is that we actually, one good thing about it, well, unfortunately it doesn't work in every case, but we can, by a very simple approach, identify when it works. You can basically just run the program a number of times with different parameters and look at the results and, and cluster the results. So if you get the same solution many times, it's almost always correct. So you can take that, uh, uh, and we call it PCOS doc from my old names, and you can use some different parameters, but doesn't really matter, but you have basically a separation of correct and incorrect models with an area on the cover, curve over 0.9 or higher. So you're very good at knowing when you have good correct models. Unfortunately, the total number of correct models, if you rank with that, doesn't change very much, but at least you know when you're correct. Okay, then we start started asking a bit more questions about how can we, I mean, where does these good models come from? So we looked at the taxas, so you can see they can actually come from eukaryotes, bacteria, archaea, we don't have the money, viruses, we don't have any, but also of multiple six alignments that have a mix of eukaryotes and, and archaea. So it seems to be no, I mean, slightly higher performance on average in the bacteria than in the eukaryotes, the mixed one you see. And the archaea, the only two ones I have are pretty good, but so it might be slightly easier to do for, for proteins that are predominantly uh, bacterial ones. So we tried a bit like that. So we could basically try to take only bacterial proteins around that and use the multiple threat for multiple six elements. And there are one or two cases that you get better, but on average, it was slightly worse. We could try to take more proteomes. We could try to take all the proteomes and not only the reference proteomes and make a bigger amount of experiments. And there are also a few cases where you get better predictions, but actually a few cases where you get worse predictions also. So on average, it doesn't make any, any big difference. And well, you can do this in different ways. So basically, it seems like no very good solution of, of improving it on average. There are cases where it suddenly works, suddenly helps. So you, it indicates that you need to try several different things. And now we compare it to traditional docking methods. So we have this sort of shape complementarity docking methods. We can use that either by itself or with this predicted contacts as constraints. We can use another method to predict the contacts called Raptor X. We can also use a homology modeling approach, so it's called template-based docking. And we can compare it. And it's clear that these traditional docking methods are slightly better. We have 16 correct models instead of eight or 10s so we, have, we have, but on average, it's not a huge difference, but you can see that these methods are quite complementary. So this is the quality for the traditional log methods, and this is for our methods. And you can see that the, there's absolutely no correlation at all. So clearly you have cases when our method works and when their methods do not work. So they, they should be, if you combine them, you should be, you should be able to, to a more complementary answer. The problem is that the, the, their methods are not, the traditional methods are notably bad at knowing when you get a correct answer. So often you need to make 10 models and just hopefully that one of them is correct. But in contrast, our method is pretty good at that. But you should be able to combine them and get a better result. Okay, then we had at least one prediction where we happened to do a good prediction. So this is a completely blind prediction of uh, in the last cast where actually we managed to get the best model. So we used this and then we did some manual intervention also, but we make a quite nice docking model. It's not so many contacts that predict this. Now, now in this case, this is, not a this is not a native structure because we don't know that. But we only predict 50 contacts, but it sort of makes it quite good model. It's not perfect, but it's quite good. And we had use of tricks to get the best models. But at least it shows you that we can do this blindly in some cases. Okay, we also tried to apply this to uh, Corona or COVID-19. And uh, here, of course, you, you can do this in two different things. Of course, you can do the, the virus-virus interactions. That's very easy. That's just to take all, protein, all virus proteins and run them against each other. And of course, we have a lot of sequence data, so that is trivial. But the more challenging thing is to try to take interaction between the host virus, host and the virus. And for that, you need to match the virus sequence to the host genome. 
And obviously, we don't have the host gene of all types of bats. We had to assume that if it's a bat virus, it, it actually interacts with all bats. Or if it's, uh, so we have to, so we tried some play around with some cases. And of course, it's some of the genomes are not very good quality and so on. So it's, it's not super trivial, but it, it might, at least in some cases, we seem to get some results that maybe make sense. So this is just uh, for how you get from a, uh, probably wrong prediction, but you get the uh, uh, interaction to virus proteins, NSP7 and NSP8. We have very strong signal, you can get some interaction between them. But that's not really agrees with the structure, but it's, uh, it's yeah. But you have at least a few cases where we matched the experimentally characterized um, proteins that were known to interact with the coronavirus protein, and then we Try to model them. This was just one case, and it's P7P21964 and LNG. LNG, and this looks maybe less feasible because it looks a bit like artifacts, but at least the model looks decently okay, I think. So, okay, just to conclude, I think um, is that in general, today, even before AlphaFold did the cast analysis, we can basically predict the structure of all individual proteins, as long as they are decently well folded and we have enough sequence data, which we have in most cases. However, we still are quite far away from predicting all the interaction partners. Uh, and at least at the, currently, we basically have three different methods that we can use blocking the traditional methods, that is based on shape complementarity, the template-based docking, and the contact base, and now, but we introduced here this fold, combined folding and blocking methods. And in general, the performance of these methods is quite similar. So you can combine them and uh, uh, get better results. However, if you, if you just can get these alignments right, you can get, figure out how to get this alignment. I'm pretty convinced that these uh, fold and dock methods that we talk about here have more potential. At first, because it hasn't been tried so long, but uh, we don't need to limit ourselves to proteins that have a known structure. We actually don't care about if the structure is known or not. If it's known, we can use that information. If it's not, we cannot, but it doesn't really affect the results that much. The sequence data are gonna be bigger and bigger. And the main, so the, you saw that the number of cases we had not enough sequence data in the interactions of one third of cases, that's just probably that could be more data available soon. If there are homologs, there should be more homologs available. So you can be more data. However, the main challenge is for this is how do we find, to identify two multiple sequences, two sequences that we know interact in the same way as the ones we want to test. So we want to find conserved pairs of sequences that have a similar interaction pattern. And that's still an unsolved problem that we will need to address. And yeah, first I want to acknowledge that TRS Eta is actually was very nice. It's better than our own AI methods to do this. Pietras, who taught me everything about docking, I know. Claudio, who taught me about transports and other things, not about member proteins. Julie, who run this reciprocal uh, best hits here. And uh, Gabriella also helped with the running a lot of things for this project. And John and uh, wrote the PyCons fold, our, our local version of the docking program, he wrote that. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mane. And uh, that was a very inspiring presentation, I think. So I'd like to open up the floor for uh, questions now. And please write your questions in the, in the chat. Uh, and I will read them out loud. And if, since people and everybody are now typing, I assume, mm -hmm. uh, I will ask one, one question now. So you, you sort of, uh, there have been some gaps you say here, and I think AlphaFold was sort of uh, was a bit, uh, uh, it was a, quite a leap, I think, at least uh, what, what the, a lot of people expressed that. So what do you think, do you, can we expect more leaps? like this 
I, I, I think that there are a number of challenges left. And of course, this, this interaction is the next step. I'm sure AlphaFold is working on that. And I uh, think this, I mean, unless they have come up with a very good solution for matching the alignments, they're going to have problems. Basically, sure, they're going to look slightly better maybe than we do today, but I don't think it will be a revolution. There are a number of AI methods on the I mean, ideas published on how to match these alignments. Uh, you basically can train, uh, I mean, you, you can try to train the networks to identify them. So far, and, and there are also a lot of these language models appearing that people use, but then you try to you should think that you could maybe try to input that and use them somehow. So far, I haven't seen anyone publish anything uh, that really works, but uh, there is certainly a lot of interest in this area. So, I mean, there's some other challenges also. The other challenges are more probably due to uh, like flexible proteins, which have different conformations and so on. And uh, these are, my guess is uh, possible to overcome. So they're, 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 it's, the problem there is more like what type of training data do you have? I mean, how do you really know if you predict flexibility correctly? I mean, you wouldn't, it's not really a good data set to train it on. So that's, um, so my, my guess is, yeah, I'm sure it's gonna be, sometimes it's gonna be a leap in, in for predicting interactions, but uh, I have, we haven't seen it yet. So that's what, of course why we try to work on it. Yep, thanks. Oh, we have some questions now uh, in the in the chat. I'll, I'll read them out. Uh, Philip Burich uh, asks, not very familiar with docking, but how would you approach allostery? Would you, the enzyme plus effector be modeled as one unit or be somehow done in a three-way interaction? So this, uh, in this case, we do it as one unit. I mean, if you would, uh, and um, there are, I guess, I mean, if you look at, yeah, so I mean, we, we, the idea is to have to do it, see everything as one system. And I think that's probably the, best way to do it because you're going to be have problem if you start uh, making one thing fixed to another thing not so I think that the key thing is to do it in one way. And uh, Simon uh, also Simon Olson asks uh, thanks for that talk what's your impression on how to import on as to how important deep learning methods are to actually capture higher order interactions between low side? I mean in this case, and even the case of work, of course, we have tried with not with methods that don't use deep learning, and you don't get hardly anything. So it really makes, I mean, the a fundamental data is the same, but it really the accuracy improves quite a lot. So we, I think, I don't think I had it in the slides here, but out of these 50 examples you find here, I think we have two or three to get a good signal without it. So it's basically, it's very important. Next, uh, are you thinking about the impact of transient uh, interactions during the binding process? Would these co-evolve? And if so, can you work out which interactions are transient? I, I think they are, I mean, if they co-evolve, of course, you can detect them, but quite likely, in particular, if you look at things that are, like you have a lot of like disordered regions that bind to a protein. So you have, and from what I understand, the evolution of pattern them is often that you have quite many different disorder regions that can evolve quite rapidly and probably uh, independently to bind to the same region. So the evolution constraints that will be that the binding, big binding protein is very conserved because it has to bind to all these unrelated regions. So you, then you would not have a co-evolution, you wouldn't have an evolution on one side. So then you would need to use more of a physical based method. Of course, you can still use deep learning, I think that for understanding the physics or whatever, understanding interactions, but it's, it's quite likely that there are a number of interactions that do not involve any co-evolution, I would imagine. And transient, yeah, particular transient ones, that's my guess. So it, that's, uh, it'll be harder, I think. So was that, uh, any follow-up questions we, we see on that? Yeah. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So how does M MSA independent methods compare to methods that explicitly that? So far, uh, there are a number of MSA independent methods. So far, they have not worked. I don't think anybody, I mean, there were a number of people tried them last time, but uh, they have not really worked that well. I mean, they are, that's my, uh, one problem is that you, they are pretty good for detecting sometimes the things are, that are belongs to the same family. 
So you have this in PFAM users nowadays, but they are not, the alignments good out are not accurate enough. So I think it's, it's just, so basically you need, we, we need to have alignments of other so, so far people are working on it, but it doesn't, I haven't seen any great success yet. Someone uh, asked about yeah. transformer based methods. Yeah, okay, transformer methods, yeah. Uh, so basically that's certainly you can, uh, exactly what network, I mean, what this is using is, is not, this is basically just the, uh, I'm a, a recurrent, uh, I'm a CNN that used to the CNN here, so that's, but uh, in the, the transformers is, I know that AlphaFold tried it and they said it didn't work, so they did not use it. They use a graph of a network with uh, attention. So uh, people, I'm sure uh, transformers works great in many other things and it is very useful, particularly very efficient for training. But uh, I, I haven't, I mean, so that's uh, only heard. I don't know what Alpha Fold did, but what it might did. But they they said that they tried it and didn't get it to work, or didn't get it in the gain, which they did not use it. So I'm sure it can work if you do the right way, but it's most likely not necessary. Uh, was something about Cassandra? Thanks for uh, for the combined MSA. Is it a combination of the MSA of the two sequences? Yes, it is. Basically, you need to you have. MSA1 and MSA2, when you basically have to identify which rows attach. Like you start with the two sequences in top that you want, that you know, that you want to predict. Then you want to say, uh, is, yes, you, so what you do is you take all the hits from one genome, one proteome. So if you have five hits from one proteome and then a, of, of protein A and five of protein B, and then you try to find, divide by which of these five combination of five times five are the match ones. So what we, what we do here is we just take the top hit and the top hit are assumed to align. So we basically match them by genome. There are methods that are quite time consuming that try to do this in a better way to try to combine everything. But it's clearly, uh, they are too slow to run on, on large scale data. So they don't work. And I'm not sure they work either. We have, a, uh, there are a few cases, you know, very well controlled system you've got them to work. Uh, so there are, but there are people that try it, but uh, we have, so far, I don't think, and nobody has used large scale yet, so I don't know. If it may, but that's that's so, something you need to do, and exactly the type of algorithm you want to do for ma making it the best one, we haven't figured out yet. Thank you. Any more questions to Arne? Uh, other, I mean, it's sort of yep. Here you have one more. Uh, you can read it, I guess, Arne. For dimerization, oligomerization of proteins, is possible to separate intradomain and interdomain contacts. So, uh, so one thing I uh, maybe didn't mention here: the, the, what we've done here is basically is only hetero dimeric complex. So this is basically we don't have the same chain. If it is homodimeric, so basically you have the same, so basically these oligomeric states uh, are the same chain. That's uh, you need to use a different approach. We have looked into that. We actually have a master student looking at that right now. And there are some cases where it works excellently. So you can basically, what you do in this case, basically that like you predict both the inter and the interdomain contacts or interprotein contacts, but then you have the model of the monomer and you just filter away the, the, the ones that are close to the monomer and the ones that remain, you call them interprotein contacts. So it works very well in a few cases, but that, these are the cases where you have very, very large interactive surfaces. So if you have like two beta sheets that are like packed like that, from two different chains, so you have lots of contact between them, then it works. Uh, uh, so that's uh, for things that interact more classically to global proteins, we don't really see that many contacts. It's, it's, it's hard to get a signal there. Uh, Yes, then there was a uh, question uh, from Sandra. Uh, when evaluating these models, there is free information leak with the MSA. I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but I uh, I guess that you, I mean, certainly uh, one problem is that of course, if you start including thing, members of protein pairs that do not interact in the same way. So if they're actually different, you add noise and you lose the signal very rapidly. So that's quite likely what, what happens when we do this, um, when we lose the signal. So you saw we had an example with if you use three iterations of MSA, you have no signal, but if you use one, you get it. So certainly we pick up some homologs that 
have a different interaction passage and then the signal is lost very rapidly. So that's sort of an information leak in one way. I'm not sure that was exactly what you wondered about, but if not, type again. Or, or you can uh, ask a question or you can just unmute and ask yeah. Sandra. Oh, okay. So, so it wasn't quite what I was thinking about. Uh, so I'm thinking that, so you're constructing these MSAs uh, from a database uh, then, but then you are constructing uh, MSAs for like a test set then uh, from the same database and maybe uh, then you're including information like in the same uh, with the training data and the test data. Okay, okay. So, yeah, you mean yeah, you mean more if it was been overtrained. Certainly there is some risk of that. So certainly there is a risk. I mean, not maybe this this contact predictor because this was actually trained on the thing on, on the monomers, not on the interactions, but certainly certainly you could absolutely overtrain these methods if you if you don't do it correctly. And now the all these good methods have been tested. I mean, we have in, in the community we have quite I mean, we have this CASP conferences, which is this really blind prediction, which is really, really blind. Nobody knows the answer when you start. And of course, if you have a method that is overtrained, it will not perform very well there. And so these methods here are, uh, uh, so my experience is, is that it has not been, the methods I tried, both our own ones and the ones we tried from others, is that they are not very overtrained. They are quite performance on tests and training sets and also completely independent blind tests are very similar. So I am not, I mean, it certainly can be done. I'm sure it can be done, but it's you know, just for this particular context, I'm not too worried about it. Because that's, yeah, just by experience. Good. Um, I can ask one more question. I mean, it's sort of the, the problems you're solving. I mean, you use they have a lot of different steps and sometimes you use AI machine learning for, 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 for individual steps and sometimes you solve, try to solve multiple steps uh, sort of uh, implicitly using an AI and so on. Uh, do you see do you see that this will continue or will it be will some parts be more black boxes because they are considered more like solved problems and, and, and the standard so, practices? So of course what um, I mean if you look at one of the claims of the success of AlphaFold is that they, they have an end-to-end -end solution. So they really have a differentiable solution from they start with the MSA. So the MSA is still provided. So that is not a part of the, the machine learning. But so they, they have done that. But they end up, end up with the structure. So they, it goes all the way in one, one network, if you want to put it. Uh, exactly how to do it and how, to, how, how it works, we don't know. But uh, it, it's clearly something that you can get the gradient all the way down to this final model. So that's probably the way to do it because I'm sure there's a lot, lot of things like I mean, now we do it basically we start with the MSA. And actually what we what we have done and most people done is actually we don't even start with the MSA, we start with features that we extract from the MSA. So that so that, so that we basically predict this type of contacts and then other other features and uh, use that and we predict this distances, then we plug these distances into a, some program for making a model. But of course, if you had the model itself directly as part of the procedure, of course, you could probably learn things that are, I mean, I mean you could learn things like I mean, particularly more detailed things about the uh, sidechain packing and so on, and uh, other type of features also that you don't get from the uh, context directly. And, and that's, uh, on the other hand, it's probably quite much harder to train it because it gets much bigger. But uh, that's what, the, that's what, of course, what DeepMind did. Have their model is from the MSA, without any features and then they do it all the way to a 3D structure. But I mean, that's for a single chain. I'm sure they can expand it to multiple chains technically to get it right as that story. But, and uh, yeah, so I mean, and of course there are also this alignment free methods for getting, finding home logs in a database that are independent. You, in theory, you could even start with a single sequence have it that trade on the end, database will go all the way up. But that, that, that they didn't do. And I think it's, they are not good enough to do that yet. It'll be interesting to, to see what, what uh, comes next. It's uh, rapidly 
emerging field yeah. right now. We're evolving a lot, we're evolving fast. Thanks a lot, uh, Arne, for, for coming here today. I don't think we have any more questions. So, so uh, with that, we, we uh, say uh, thank you and uh, we conclude and mm -hmm. welcome back uh, to, to the next seminar in this AI series. So keep an eye on our, uh, on the Silaf Lab website, we will be announced these uh, presentations. Thanks again, Arne. Thanks for listening. And bye-bye, uh, everyone. Bye.